Greetings, everyone, uh, and welcome to this uh, uh, panel discussion on uh, Seeking Solace in the Beautiful, the Spirit of Islamic Art. Uh, my name is Ali Asani, and I'm a professor at Harvard University who, uh, who works in the intersection between religion, literature, and the arts. And joining me in the panel discussion um, are Professor Fairchild Ruggles from uh, Illinois University and, and Professor Farshid Imami from Rice University. So I'm going to start out this, uh, this event by sharing with you some of my ideas on the importance of art and aesthetics in the Islamic tradition. When one thinks about Islam, uh, many people don't connect Islam with the arts. However, uh, I would argue that Islam was a tradition that was born out of arts and aesthetics. And I would base my argument of the importance of art, beauty, aesthetics in Islam uh, in the Quran itself. So when people generally think about the Quran, uh, they really think about it as a book. However, I would argue that the Quran, when it was first revealed, was not a book, it was an experience. We know the story of the Quran, uh, the way in which it was revealed. The Prophet Muhammad was meditating in a cave and he heard a voice, Ikra. Ikra bismi rabbika, read, read, or recite in the name of your Lord. That experience was overwhelming for him. Uh, and accounts tell us that he was so overwhelmed uh, at, as to what happened that he fled down the mountain, uh, Hira. He was in a cave on this mountain. He fled down the mountain and he went home. Uh, and there he is. His wife, Bibi Khadija, tried to uh, comfort him because he, he was just overwhelmed by this whole experience. This was the beginning on how this text emerged as, uh, as that something that, was, that he heard and something that he experienced. It says that the experience was so overwhelming that his heart was pounding. These are what the descriptions say, that his heart was pounding uh, he just felt that somebody had embraced him very tightly. So again, a sense of experience. And, you know, generally the experience of being in awe, he was in the same of just being in some sort of awe. In any case, he continued to have these revelations, these uh, um, verses that were, uh, that would come down to him. And as he started reciting what was being revealed to him, people would gather around him, uh, at least this is what the Muslim accounts tell us, that people would gather around him and would be so amazed at the beauty of what he was reciting that some of them would weep and cry and, some, and they couldn't explain why they were weeping and why they were crying. And we see in the Quran itself uh, an expression of, of this where uh, it talks about, you know, that God has sent out the most beautiful of all teachings, a scripture that is consistent and draws comparison and that causes the skin of those in awe of God to shiver. Right? And their skins and their hearts soften at the mention of God. Now, this is a very interesting uh, way to think about the Quran as a text that was experienced, an oral text that was experienced, and a text that recognizes its impact on the listeners. You know, this idea of the skin to shiver, like almost getting goosebumps, and their skins and their hearts to soften. This idea of the aesthetic impact of the Quran we find over and over again repeated in the early accounts of how the, Muslim, the communities in Mecca responded 
to this revelation. So we have the very famous story of uh, Omar ibn Khattab, who later on became the second caliph of Islam, who at, at one point was very skeptical of, of the messages that the Prophet Muhammad was preaching, but he had heard about the power of this Quran, but hadn't uh, from, you know, that it was a very powerful text to listen to. Uh, but he was really afraid of the power that uh, the Prophet Muhammad would accumulate around him because he was starting to gather followers. So he considered him to be really an enemy. And he had forbidden, for example, his sister to go to any of these Quran recitation sessions that were happening. And one of the accounts says that he heard that his sister had actually been attending one of these Quran recitation sessions or listening sessions, if you will, uh, secretly. And he decided to confront her. So he, uh, while she, in the middle of the night, when she went into this, uh, meeting place to hear a Quran recitation. He burst into this session and he heard this Quran. The story goes, he heard this Quran and he had never heard anything so beautiful that right there and then he started to weep and cry and he could finally comprehend what was the power of this text that he was trying to oppose. So this becomes his conversion moment, that conversion took place uh, by the, the very strength of the beauty of the text. And in fact, we find in early Islamic history, there was all this speculation going on as to what was the power of this text? Who exactly was the prophet, prophet Muhammad as he later on came to be known? Was he a magician? Was he a poet? Uh, that were the two categories that that somebody could be have such a power over words. He either has to be a magician or a poet. And why a poet? Because poets in Arab society were seen as being connected to jinns and spirits. So probably they, people thought maybe some sort of a, a really um, amazing poet who's connected to a jinn or a spirit and that makes his word powerful and has this impact on us. But the prophet Muhammad said, no, I'm neither a magician nor a poet, but I'm a prophet. And what is being revealed to me is not from some jinn, it is, it's a revelation from God. And you have um, people you know, challenging this notion that how do we know that this is divine? That this is actually coming from from, from this God that you're speaking about. And we find in the Quran, a challenge being thrown to people who doubted the, uh, the sacredness of the text, but also the beauty of this text by saying that if humans and jinns banded together and produced, tried to produce the like of this, they could never even produce something similar to this. Or some people saying, oh, you know, he, they say that he, meaning the prophet has fabricated it, fabricated the text and believe them not, tell them to produce a text as of, of similar text to this. So the constantly there's a challenge put, put out to people who doubt the meaning of the text by saying, you produce something as beautiful as this. So the beauty of the text becomes something that is sign of its divine origin. And the challenge is that, that no human can produce something as beautiful as this. And this becomes the foundation of what I would call a theology of aesthetics and beauty in Islam, a theology that sometimes we don't pay too much attention to, but it's very much there at the heart of the tradition where aesthetics and beauty are seen as a manifestation of the divine in the world, listening to the Quranic text or sama as it's called, is a way in which you commune with the divine in, and it's a moving experience. And 
the text itself was not just to be listened to, was not just an oral text, because eventually when the text gets written down, the visual text also had to be just as beautiful and inspiring. And this is where the arts of calligraphy coming and the arts of inscribing the sacred work in as beautiful a form as possible. Um, and this gives rise to this very interesting, powerful statement, a hadith of the prophet, God is beautiful and loves beauty. And that in his essence, God is beautiful. His names, his attributes, they all reflect the beauty of God. And so you find over and over in the Quran, this reference to looking at the, the, you know, looking for the face of God that surrounds us and that face of God being manifest in the beauty, sometimes nature, the signs of God are seen in nature. His names are beautiful. So you get this idea of beauty and the sacred being fused. And of course, the wonderful art of calligraphy tries to few some of this. I'm just going to show just a couple of examples. This is a beautiful Kufi Quran on blue, on blue vellum. And you can see here, you know, these words were not actually meant to be read because, you know, they're highly stylized. They were meant to be uh, appreciated. The beauty and the aesthetics of the words and the way they flow was meant to be uh, appreciate it. So in a way, pointing to the fact that this is a text that has to be experienced. And then, of course, we have the incorporation of this calligraphy into various ar um, architectural forms, like, you know, here you have an example of calligraphy in a, in a beautifully and, you know, in the, in the decor of a mosque in Iran. Um, and you get all kinds of objects, like this one is, uh, is has in its, uh, it's a filter of a jar uh, in which water is poured through, but in the filter, and this is highly magnified, you see these Quranic verses with, which read that he gave them uh, something pure to drink, meaning God gave them something pure to drink. And it's beautifully inscribed into the into the filter itself so that as the water is going through, it is also going through that sacred word. And the idea is maybe you're purifying the word itself. And then I'm just going to show another example as to how this beauty gets expressed in different ways. Um, this is a piece of, there's a close up piece of textile and all these little uh, scribblings, this is all calligraphy here. And what this belongs to is this wonderful Quran core coat. It's a jacket with the entire Quran on it. And it was meant as a talisman to ward off evil. So when the, when, the, when, the, when the caliph went into war, he would wear it under his armor or even maybe for a few minutes as a way of protecting himself, but as a work, as a, as a work of beauty again, it's not just the talismanic, the way to ward off evil, but it's a beautiful piece that's trying to reflect also the beauty of the Quran. So uh, one last sort of point that I would, I would mention here in, the, in talking about beauty and the sacred in Islam, what are human beings supposed to do with this beauty? And for this, I want to point out this, uh, the importance of this word ihsan which means to do beautiful things or to do things in a more perfect and excellent manner. So it's very often said that there are three dimensions to Islam, the religion, Islam, the act of submission, Iman, the act of faith, and Ihsan. And Ihsan, the word Ihsan, comes from the Arabic word for beauty and elegance, Hosan. And Musan is somebody who does what is beautiful. And being a Mosin is reaching sort of the highest stages of faith. So I think in, in essence, this is saying is that if God is beautiful, human beings have to try to be as beautiful as possible in a way that they are actually reflecting 
God's beauty. So by this idea that beauty is a sign of God and all beauty, even that of human beings as persons, uh, beautiful persons is actually also a sign of faith. So I'm going to stop my comments here and um, turn it over um, to uh, Professor uh, Fairchild Ruggles. Hello, I'm Dee Dee, Dee Fairchild Ruggles, and I'm very pleased to be here with this distinguished panel of experts in the art and culture of the Islamic world. My own area is in the area of gardens and landscape, and that's what I'll be talking about with you. These days, many of us are finding surprising pleasure in walking outdoors, meeting friends outdoors, enjoying the sun, the air, the view of nature. But while this may be a new or renewed experience for many of us, the understanding of the garden as a place of pleasure and healing is at the heart of an Islamic garden. Islamic gardens and landscapes are sensory environments. We love them for the color and texture of the plants and flowers grown there, but they also offer other sensory experiences such as sound. You can almost hear the water spray here at a garden in Iran. And if we look at this set of images, you can almost hear the vigor of the water as it pours over this chadar in a garden. We can imagine the sound of the birds that we see in this manuscript, this detail of a manuscript illustration. And of course, we can imagine the music that might be played by human beings in gardens. In fact, we have images from manuscripts that show musical soirees occurring out in the garden. In this case, an enclosed courtyard garden with vegetation and the musicians and singers seated directly on the ground. In addition to sound, we can appreciate gardens for the tactile sense. Here at the Generalife, which is the palace right next to the Alhambra, the handrails on either side of this downward sloping series of stairs, the handrails invite us to dip our fingers into the cool water. And we're looking up that same set of stairs here. And you can see the water rushing down those handrails. And of course, the very sight of flowers often impels many of us, certainly me, to lean forward and touch the bloom and perhaps to pick the fruit. In touching the leaves of herbs such as mint or rosemary, we walk away with the scent of its pungent oil. So we go from tactility to scent. Scent is the most elusive, yet I think the most profoundly important of the senses. The fragrance of the rose intensifies as we get closer to it. It invites us to draw near, to immerse ourselves in the garden. In other words, referring to Dr. Asani's uh, introduction, his, his um, talk, it is a, a body experience. It is a kind of um, experiential way of being in the garden. The difference between looking at a garden, which is what we're doing now, we're not actually in this garden, we're just looking at a, a picture of it. So the difference between looking and being in one is that one is purely visual, while the other is a bodily experience in which all the senses are engaged. And those senses are important because they tie us to the living world. So think about this. To see something, we are always at a distance from it. The thing we look at is beyond ourselves. It's outside of ourselves, out there in the material world, away from us. We can see the world, but we cannot really see ourselves, not completely anyway. But to smell something, we instinctively lean toward it and draw the scent into our noses, literally inhaling it so that it becomes part of us. It becomes part of our very bodies. And this is the power of the garden. We don't simply look at it. We experience it in a visceral way. The garden is an extraordinarily important art form because through the garden, we express our relationship to the earth, to God's creation. In the Islamic world, the garden is a deeply meaningful form of artistic expression. And it's possible that the garden gains so much significance in Islam because the task of making a garden in the hot, dry environments where Islam begins was so very difficult. Even in, yet even in the area, in the era before modern mechanizations, 
farmers managed to collect enough water to transform even a desert environment into a productive landscape. And you see that here, this little oasis in which out of you know, just sand emerges palm trees. And that very struggle, that act of transformation is meaningful because it fulfills the mandate in the Quran to serve as stewards of the earth. In a sense, we are asked to tend the earth as though it were a garden. In the Quran, we read, he subjugated for you whatsoever is in the heavens and the earth, each and everything. In other words, God makes creation and humans tend it. In many ways, what makes a garden beautiful is not its natural attributes, but its very artificiality, that sign of human presence. So for example, looking at this landscape in Iran, it's because we work so hard to make that garden, that cultivated, transformed space, that it appears as something different and better than the surrounding landscape. In this walled garden in Iran, divided into four parts, it stands out from the surrounding landscape and the walls enclose plots that contain water. That's the thing that differentiates the enclosed area from everything around it. And the water is piped in through an underground conduit called a kanat. It is the enclosure's removal from the rest of the land that makes it special. It is the fact that it is not natural that makes it special. So too, we could look at this aerial view of a kanat as it fans out into the landscape. And you can see the water coming on the down from the mountains and spreading out in this fan-like manner. And then the plots made by farmers in which each farmer has aligned his plot to coordinate with the path of the water, trying to extract as much water as possible from that very precious water course. Now, at this point, you may be wondering why I have not yet mentioned the Chahar Bagh, a classic garden divided into two quadrants with symbolism that ranges from the agricultural to the paradisiac. We see a particularly wonderful example of a Chahar Bagh at the Alhambra's Court of the Lions in Spain. In the enclosed courtyard, four water channels run toward the center of the garden, meeting at the lion's fountain. The vegetation is missing, largely because no one really knows what kind of vegetation might have been planted there. In fact, many modern historians think that its only planting was a few orange trees. In the tomb of Humayun, we see another example of a four-part garden, with the tomb at the center and the garden around it divided into quadrants that, if you know the garden at all, you know are divided yet again into subunits. The most common explanation for the Chahar Bagh with its four part layout is that it is intended to mirror paradise as described in the Quran. The Quran in several different verses describes paradise as having four streams of water, fresh milk, wine, and honey, and also having fruits of every kind and shade. This describes a garden with four channels perhaps arranged cross-axially to form a Chahar Bagh. However, this verse does not describe all Islamic gardens. Some earthly gardens were clearly meant to mirror paradise. For example, the tomb garden that we've seen here again, where the body of the deceased emperor rests in a garden as his soul rests in paradise. But not all gardens follow this model. In fact, the classic Chahar Bagh that we think of, typically when we think of Islamic gardens, seems to appear mostly in later periods. This tomb of Humayun dates to the 16th century. The great garden estates of Kashmir date to the 17th century. And I'm just showing you the plan so you can see that this is a very rectilinear cross axial Chahar Bagh type. Or the, the Taj Mahal, Another kind of classic example of a Chahar Bagh dates to the 17th century. These are relatively modern sites. If we look throughout all times and places in the Islamic world, as I did in my book on Islamic gardens, we see relatively few gardens divided into four parts by channel. For example, if we go to the oldest continuously planted garden in Islam, we're at the great mosque of Cordoba starting in 786, and yet the mosque courtyard was not a four-part arrangement, but was organized in rows of trees. 
The trees were irrigated by water channels, but the layout is not cross axial. This does not bear resemblance to paradise as described in the Quran, despite the fact that it is a mosque setting. Instead, it hearkens to the world of 8th century Islam, the time that the mosque was built, where farmers were busily fulfilling that other Quranic mandate to serve as good stewards of the earth given to them by God. The mosque courtyard is an orchard and a productive orchard yielding fruit. In this sense of productivity, it seems inspired by a different Quran verse that describes the abundance of the earth. It is he who sends down water from the skies and brings out of it everything that grows. The green foliage, grain lying close, date palm trees, gardens of grapes, olives, pomegranates. This is a modern translation. For myself, I find all Islamic gardens beautiful, whether or not they belong to the family of the great four-part Shahar Bagh, or whether it's simply a farmer's agricultural plot. Some of the gardens that I like best are those where we see people performing their role as stewards, transforming the land and making it productive. Here, a mountain landscape made suitable for farming by creating stepped terraces. Each level holds a cultivated plot where water is retained on the level surface long enough to soak into the soil. It is the more humble aspects of these gardens that I love best those where we express where we express our relationship to the earth that sustains us in very simple terms. In Iran, we see a channel that irrigates trees, allowing them to grow in an otherwise desert landscape. In Cyprus, at the military border that divides the north and south sides of the island, a scar in the city's architectural fabric is softened by a climbing vine and a potted plant, a sign of hope perhaps. At an Egyptian oasis, water channels divide the land into plots with deep furrows, all of it designed to maximize a limited supply of water and to enable the farmer to grow food. In Kashan, at a cafe with a pipe dripping into a crudely built basin, a garden is made. In Fez, a brick path divides the garden, allowing us to enter into it. In this Ottoman cemetery in Rhodes, the fact that the garden is untended tells us that the Muslim population is gone. Its neglect contrasts with the much better tended cemetery in Istanbul. This one belongs to an emperor's tomb. These days, I'm spending a lot of time not simply looking at my own garden, but in it, gathering safely outdoors with friends, eight feet apart, wearing those masks that none of us likes, but that we must wear to protect the people around us. In this sometimes isolating, lonely, somewhat confusing time, I'm reading good books, listening to music, and seeking solace in my own garden. Hello, uh, my name is Farshid Imami, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Art History at Rice University. Uh, it's my pleasure to join this panel with Dr. Rasani and Dr. Ruggles, and thank you for the kind invitation. I'm truly honored. Um, so today I'm going to speak to you about poetry and architecture in Muslim cultures. Um, so poetry and architecture are arguably among the most acclaimed cultural achievements of Muslim cultures across time and space. As Dr. Asani showed us, calligraphy was a major form of ornamentation in Islamic architecture. And along with verses from the Quran, poetic inscriptions also graced the works of architecture across the Islamic world. Um, so today I'm going to show you three examples from different parts of the Islamic world where poetry and poetic inscriptions played a major role in architectural ornamentation. And then I'll reflect, reflect a little bit about um, how uh, these poems um, express notions of beauty and convey the spirit of beauty in Islamic art. So the first example and probably the most uh, famous Islamic buildings which has poetic inscriptions is the Alhambra in and Dr. Ruggles and, um, and um, many other uh, scholars have written about it. And um, I'm uh, 
I'm, I'll just make a very few quick points about the Alhambra here. Uh, so Alhambra is uh, is a palace of the Nasrid rulers. Is it? It's the uh, last uh, Muslim dynasty to rule in Iberia, uh, the, Pen the Iberian Peninsula, which is what is today Portugal and Spain, in a small part of the in the south of the peninsula. It is probably the palace complex at the Alhambra, the most intricate building of the world, and that wouldn't be an exaggeration. Many people agree with that assessment, and it's richly decorated in carved stucco with vegetal forms and, uh, and inscriptions. Um, and we looked at the uh, Court of the Lions in Dr. Ruggles uh, presentation with, with the four uh, water channels that intersect at the uh, fountain at the center. And uh, the detailed uh, intricate um, carved stucco mukarna ceilings of the complex. But the Alhambra is also known for its poetic inscriptions, and these are poems that were composed specifically for the building by court poets, and they are inscribed on the walls, um, as this one that you see here, which is the uh, Hall of the Two Sisters in the Court of the Lions, in the Palace of the Lions. These are graceful poetic inscriptions, um, in a stucco, in a background of vegetal uh, decoration. And these are exactly at eye level. So they were meant to be read and appreciated. And this also speaks to the idea of embodied experience. These poems are meant to be part of the experience of the building. And um, they are so central to the experience of the Alhambra. And many of them are composed in the first person voice which means that we have a speaking building, building that is speaking directly to its audiences. So I'm just going to go over some of the inscriptions in the uh, Kumaras Palace. Kumaras Palace is one of the two major components of the palace complex in the Alhambra. This is also known as the Court of the Myrtles. And here we are looking at the Kumaras Tower, which was the main uh, reception hall of the palace complex. So this is a square room with alcoves that overlook the landscape outside in the city of Granada. And uh, the Kumaras Tower has um, a range of inscriptions, both Quranic and poetic inscriptions. And uh, these are covering the walls, the stucco walls uh, of the Kumaras Palace and the, and, the, and the reception hall itself is covered by a wooden ceiling with geometric patterns in, uh, with patterns that are formed of uh, uh, star and polygons. So the inscriptions include uh, uh, verses from the Quran, uh, the Surah Al-Falak, which is around the arch, uh, made at the main entrance, Surah Al-Mulk, uh, the Dominion, uh, which is inscribed beneath the dome. And there are also poems inside the central alcove on the lower level of the walls. So there is a clear uh, spatial hierarchy in where the inscriptions appear. So the Quranic verses are high on walls and uh, human created poems are inscribed on the lower parts of the wall. So there's a uh, spatial dialogue between the human voice and the voice of, of, of God. The uh, Quranic inscription from the Surah al mulk reads, blessed is he who is, whose hand is dominion and he is all of our things competent. He who created death and life to test you as, you, as to which of you is best indeed. And he is the exalted in, my, in might, the forgiving, and who created seven heavens in layers. You do not see in the creation of the most merciful any imperfection. So return your vision to the sky. Do you see any fissure? So this has been interpreted as a reference to the um, geometric patterns that we see on the ceiling. And some scholars read it as as a representation of the seven layers of, of the heaven as it's described uh, in the Quranic verses. The poetic inscription, which is composed in the first uh, 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 person voice, appears on the alcove and the lower parts of the wall, and it's response to the Quranic inscription. 
I read some of the uh, lines of uh, the first lines. You received from me morning and evening solutions of blessing, prosperity, happiness, and friendship. This is the light dome, and we are its daughter. Yet I have distinction and glory in my family. I am the heart amidst other parts of the body, for it is the heart that resides this that that resides this strength and of soul and spirit. So here the uh, uh, verses are also referring to the Quranic verses on the on the on, on the top of the wall uh, in be, below the dome and establish a relationship between the word of humans and the world of uh, divine. My second example comes from the Shahis in the complex in uh, Samarkand uh, in Uzbekistan today. Uh, Shahis in the, which literally means living king, is a major shrine in the city of Samarkand and uh, attributed to the cousin of the Prophet Muhammad, Qusam ibn Abbas. Uh, during the 15th, 14th and 15th century, centuries, a series of funerary buildings were built here by members of the Timurid dynasty. And these tombs were arranged along a narrow 200 meter long alley that leads to the shrine. Most of these uh, buildings are decorated with glazed uh, ceramic tiles which include, again, vegetal forms and inscriptions. Um, one of the earliest and best preserved monuments of the Shah Zenda complex is the mausoleum of Shah de Mulk Aga. Uh, she was a, a daughter of a sister of Timur, and uh, the building is richly decorated with exquisite glazed ceramic tiles, both inside and outside. Here we see on the screen the uh, recessed recessed arch at the entrance to the tomb cham chamber, which is decorated with a Mokarnas uh, uh, half dome. And Mokarnas refers to these uh, stalactites, these uh, small niches that are stacked on top of one another to create this uh, exquisite uh, half dome here. The building, uh, the uh, mausoleum is the work of two masters named Zainadin and Shamsaddin who put their signatures on the building. Uh, and uh, the building is also decorated with poetic inscriptions. So below the Mokarnas uh, the dome, there is, a, there is an inscription band executed in white cursive script on a blue background. And this is a poem in Persian that reads, this ceiling covered in Mokarnas and this ornate arch are reminiscent of the art of beauty, Zain or Zainatin. Every ornament and art that you see in the world exists only by the grace of the creator, the almighty. So it seems that there is a pun in the use of the word Zain. Zain means beauty, so the art of beauty, but also Zain could also be a reference to Zain ad-Din, the artist who created uh, this work. So this is both, a, both an expression of humility in, in the face of the creations of God, but also a signature of authorship, a sign of authorship and, uh, and the status and the great work, uh, a, reminisce, a reminder to viewers that this is a work of, a, of an artisan named Zain din My last example is the uh, Maidan -e Nakhsh Jahan, image of the world square in Safavid, Iran, built in the 17th century. This is a huge complex uh, surrounded by shopping arcades and uh, monumental mosques and uh, palaces and commercial complexes. But even this huge complex has its own poetic inscription that gives a voice to its designer and engages the viewers in a different way. Um, so the poetic inscriptions appear on the portal to the Caesarea, which is located on the north side of the complex and they are on the side walls. And these are two verses uh, from the Golestan Rose Garden by the 13th century poet Sadi. 
So these are executed in what is known as square Kufic inscription. This is a form of uh, inscription that is particularly used for architectural decoration. It's a grid-like uh, form of a script and, um, and that was very common in this period for architectural decoration. So, and it's usually, and th uh, these inscriptions typically read clockwise, uh, so you need to turn your head um, 360 degrees to read the entire, uh, entire poem, and it starts from here. So these are two verses from the uh, Golestan. One verse is on the eastern side, and the, the second verse in the, in the uh, east, western side. So there is a kind of dialogue in, in architectural space here. Um, so the poem reads, the wishes that a trace of us survives as I see no permanence in existence. One day maybe a sage mercifully prays on behalf of the poor. Uh, so these are, you know, very famous verses from the early, from the introduction to the Golestan of Saadi. And this was an important text, maybe after the Quran, uh, the second text that in Persian speaking lands, a person would learn to be literate would be the would be the Golestan by Saadi. So this is evoking their two verses, but literate uh, audiences would have been able to uh, imagine and um, remember the whole uh, the whole verse. So by adding these uh, uh, poem this poem to to the work of architecture, the the designer uh, uh, was trying to elevate the status of his work again in a in a spirit of humility um, and sort of a drawing a comparison between a work of architecture and a work of uh, literature. Um, so these the three examples that we looked at from across the Islamic world gives us a sense of uh, how poetic inscriptions were used in works of architecture. So poetry gives voice to buildings, to uh, monuments, and it adds uh, a layer, a different layer, a layer of beauty that, that works with uh, um, uh, divine word and word works verses from the Quran to create this kind of embodied experience and, uh, of, of, of architecture and beauty. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for those uh, those remarks, uh, Farshid. And uh, we now have a time just for us to reflect on what we've heard. Uh, uh, I'm just going to say a few words, you know, in terms of reflecting on your presentations and where these conversations um, lead us to. Uh, I started talking about, you know, at the heart of Islam, we have the Quran and the Quran is embedded in this language of beauty and aesthetics and that the word, the sound, that the, you know, that the sacred becomes manifest in this beautiful sound. And then at the heart, and then from this beautiful sound emerge many other things. I noticed that um, both of you mentioned in, uh, in your presentations, Quranic verses that you know, again, emphasize beauties, beauties of paradise, gardens, beauty, um, uh, beauties of things that God has created, uh, nature, you know, that in nature are the signs of God. And I think there is in, in here a kind of way in which when we think about the religious experience, I would say, again, I wanted to emphasize the experience, that the religious experience in Islam is multisensory that, you know, how do you experience the divine? How do you experience the, sin, you know, the sacred? And it's not just by reading a book. It's not just by reading a work of theology or philosophy, because that's all just, I would say, discursive knowledge. It's knowledge for the mind. It's intellectual. But you can't really experience the sacred. But you can experience the sacred when, for example, you see a, a beautiful piece of architecture. You see the, you know, the poetry. If you if you are able to uh, decipher the poetry and think about its meaning, and even more important, in some of these cases, as uh, uh, Professor Ruggold, as you pointed out, that sometimes these gardens, these are these beautiful gardens, are also sites of poetry performance and music performances. So they're 
they're multi-sensory in so many different ways, but I can think about, you know, this idea of, you know, gardens and beauty that, that surround us, you know, it's, it's a theme that, that the Quran emphasizes over and over again, that how can you not believe in God when the signs of God are around you? That why don't you experience the divine? Because, you know, in the divine, you know, all this beauty that you see in the, in the world around you, is just a reflection of divine beauty. And it's just human beings try to capture some of that beauty. But ultimately, you know, it's just the shadow of the shadow and the shadow of the ultimate beauty. So, I mean, these were some thoughts that came to my mind as I was listening to both of your presentations, but I'll turn it over to whoever wants to sort of respond to that. I'll, I'll respond. Um, I was thinking as I listened to both of your presentations, um, how uh, sort of gracefully you, you leapt from one medium to another and, and how this is actually invited by the, um, by the culture itself. So the Quran, for example, is both something that we read, but also something that we hear that is almost in some respects chanted. The recitation is a, is a formal way of, of speaking. And at the Alhambra, the beautiful Mukarnas, it's called the Hall of the Two Sisters, is of course also a place where we think music was played. And we know that poetry was recited there, that the poems on the walls start in many cases being recited and if chosen by the Sultan would then be actually applied in stucco to the walls. So that multi-sensory is also a kind of multi-medium. Um, I guess what I'm saying is we sometimes forget that the arts are constantly interacting with each other. And if I may add a quick point that I, I definitely agree and uh, the more I study and ponder in medieval Islamic art, I see that Muslim artists and architects were very consciously uh, deploying and patrons these uh, multi-sensory experience. It seems that the beauty of visual forms had to be complemented by um, in a multi-sensory uh, experience, whether it's you know hearing the poetry, hearing the Quranic verses or the uh, olfactory experience and other multisensory experiences. There were, this was not, a, the addition of poetry is not an accidental addition. It's very central to the culture and to creating that kind of uh, embodied experience that is necessary to complement visual experience. And the recitation of poetry is also a performance. It's, it's even more than sound, it's also, and it's and more than architecture, it's also, the body standing, even the the delivery of the of the sermon in the mosque is a is embodied experience in that you have to stand above the congregation in order to project your voice. So uh, it's it's all of those things together. Yeah. Yeah. I think this uh, this conversation actually reminds us uh, uh, to think about religion, uh, not just as dogmas and doctrines and theology and rituals and so on. There's this whole other aspect to religion uh, or religious experience, I would say. And it reminds us of the centrality of the arts. You know, I think the visual arts, the sound arts, um, the uh, poetic arts or literary arts, uh, and, and then the, and the way they interact with each other, the different art form, to the experience of being Muslim. And, uh, and you can see definitely the artists who are involved in shaping this, or the, whether it's in landscape or the buildings and so on, they're very conscious of this, that this is really part of the heritage of, uh, of, of not just, this, uh, not just the, you know, the dynasties that, that created these, these beautiful pieces, because many of these are artworks that have been patronized by powerful rulers, but they are also things that ordinary people can just enjoy and connect with the sacred in, in very interesting ways. And I hope it gives us a whole different sort of insight into uh, the centrality of the arts for, in fact, the Muslim experience. I remember 
And I think this is the sort of the last thing I wanted to say, and then you can, you know, I was once having a conversation with, uh, at a university with, with, uh, with an audience and talking about the arts and uh, one person made the remark, oh, the arts are nice, you know, but they're like the icing on the cake, you know, they're not the real thing. And my response was to say, no, the arts are the cake and <laughs> everything else, the theology, the law, the philosophy, that's all the icing. But if you really want to understand what Islam is about, it's really about these arts in their various forms that it's meant to be experienced. And that's where I think the power of the tradition lies and its appeal to people around the world. So, If I may respond to part of uh, your statement. So what I really like about especially the two poems in Samarkand and in Isfahan is that they are, we can hear the voice of artisans. So although the mausoleum was commissioned by a powerful Timurid princess, the poem I think is the voice of the artisan and it's how he understands his creation. And even the poem by Saadi in the Maidan in Esfahan is also an, a statement on the part of the, of the uh, architect. Uh, so some of these, uh, little, it might be a small addition, but it reveals a lot about the nature of uh, art artistic creation in Muslim cultures, especially in this period. That voice of the artisan, um, you know, it, eternity is a very hard thing to conceptualize. I just don't know what it is. But when I think of a poet whose words are still speaking to me, even when the poet has been gone these 400 years, that's the moment when I suddenly start to have a small glimmer of understanding of what eternity means, you know, to exist beyond your, yourself. Um, and we see that in the arts. It's in the arts that these artists continue to speak to us, the poets continue to speak to us, even the patrons, you know, in having made it possible, continue to affect us. Yeah, so with that, I think we'll, um, we'll end our conversation. It's been so wonderful to uh, be part of this uh, panel and this conversation with the both of you. So thank you so much for uh, joining us. Wow, this was really an inspiring and thought-provoking discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Asani, Dr. Ruggles, and Professor Imami for your precious time and great insight about seeking solace in the beautiful spirit of Islamic art through nature, inscriptions, architecture, and poetry. Special thanks to Dr. Asani for coordinating and moderating this discussion. On behalf of the Islamic Art Society and board members, I would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to you all. Thank you so much. Oh, <laughs>